Gabrielina Tonga, Olako, Yadimako, Apisa Hanji, Liga Natoka, Hachimanoli. Hi, everyone. I just greeted you in the Chickasaw language. Uh, my name is Shannon Speed, and I'm Chickasaw and Chalkka by descent and citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. And I have the honor of serving as the director of the American Indian Studies Center at UCLA. I acknowledged the Gabrielino Tonga peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, which encompasses much of what is today called Los Angeles, as well as the South Channel Islands, and upon which the American Indian Studies Center in UCLA reside. This means, of course, that we are guests in these lands and should be conscious at all times of our responsibilities in fostering and maintaining right relations as guests. It's therefore a great honor today to host our two incredibly talented Tongva guests, River Taku Garza and Mercedes Durami. We are holding this as one of two events in honor of California Native American Day, officially on Friday, September 25th. Um, and so it's fitting and a true honor to welcome our guests, who are, in fact, our hosts in these lands. Ashlakat Chukma, it's good that you're here. Your presence is a gift, and we welcome you. Chukma Oh, wait, you're muted, Pamela. Thank you, sorry about that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Pamela J. Peters. I am the Operations and Event Coordinator at the UCLA American Indian Studies Center. As a Diné woman living here on Tavangar, otherwise known as Los Angeles, I too would like to pay my respects to the Tongva ancestors, the elders, and all relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. I feel it's important to acknowledge our tribal relatives' homeland, and I understand I am a visitor here, as my homeland is the Navajo Nation. We are presenting this event not only to share the amazing work of two remarkable Tongva artists, but also to celebrate and learn about the rich California cultures, histories, and heritage. This event is about participation, about providing a platform where viewers like yourself can hear about the remarkable work that these two individuals are doing to preserve their culture and educate about the tribal people of Los Angeles through their art. I'm excited to share the astonishing work these two have. I've known both of these artists for years and I can call them my friends. First, we will start with a presentation from Mercedes Dora May. Thereafter, I will introduce River Garza and he will talk about his work. I will then bring them together for a brief discussion after which you can ask questions via the chat box. Thank you and I will go into introducing you to Mercedes. Oops, hold on. Trying to share something here. Hold on. So Mercedes Dorame was born in Los Angeles, California. She received her MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute and her undergraduate degree from UCLA. She calls on her Tongva ancestry to engage the problematics of visibility and ideas of cultural construction. Dora May recently received a Creative Capital Award grant and her work is part of a permanent collection of the Hammer Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Triton Museum, the Allen Memorial Museum, and the Seaside Museum, among others. She was recently honored by UCLA as an outstanding alum for the last 100 years as part of the Centennial Initiative, UCLA, Our Stories, Our Impact, and was part of the Hammers Museum Biennial made in LA 2018. Her work continues to be shown internationally. Here is Mercedes Derme. Hi, um, thank you all for being here. Um, I feel like there is no here here, but it's nice to all come together in this virtual space. Um, so I'm gonna share my um, some work as while well I talk through it. Um, and as I was preparing for this, I always have this moment of how far do I go back? And I feel like 
when I talk about my work, there's always this context that kind of comes into play. And so I kind of always start from the beginning, but I'm gonna to try to make it an annotated beginning. Um, and so this is one of my earliest pieces, um, these series of photographs titled Living Proof. And it was a time when I was um, going through grad school when I was making this, and I was given this disc of photographs of my family by my father. And I found myself at times not recognizing them um, or not understanding um, who all everybody in these images were because, um, hold on a second, for some reason you did, I have to, that one more time okay here we go so um this is how i remember my grandparents this is who i grew up with this is that uh, you know the people i recognize but as i was looking through um my own history my own memories of them i started to understand that so much of the native culture was kind of buried underneath this idea of trying to fit into a city and a place that maybe wasn't so welcoming. And I always found that kind of, you know, so strange because, you know, it was my grandfather's ancestral land. And so what does it mean to live in a place that you are kind of not very welcome in? And so as I was going through these photographs, I saw these pictures of my grandmother and my grandfather and, you know, her hair is down and that was so different from how I ever remember seeing her. And for me, this was a way of taking these images and kind of re-infusing them into my experience, like recreating memories, re-understanding, um, decoding so many of these memories I had um, with a new context. Um, and it was a really kind of difficult process because so often, as I know many people have a, a similar experience with you know, generations that come before you of like, oh, I wish, I wish I had known more. I wish I've heard more stories. I wish I was older so I could ask these questions. Um, and sometimes you get frustrated because, um, because of the shame and imposition of, of what happened, you know, the shame around being native, they hid a lot of what um, they knew. And sometimes I, I would feel frustrated about that. But then you know, this work for me, a lot of it was kind of a, a letting go of that and kind of this moment of, of, of recontextualizing this personal history in a broader historical narrative and kind of understanding so many of the, the political and cultural kind of um, impositions that created kind of the scenario. And so um, in working through these kind of histories, it, um, it really kind of got um, escalated as I was, you know, hearing stories. And, you know, one, one story I heard when I was talking to a family member about this house, this house, this is an image of a house that I grew up in um, playing as a child. It, you know, the neighbors sent around a petition to try to stop my family from moving into that house. Um, and so what does it mean to live in a place where people are literally trying to kind of keep you out? And it's also this, you know, crazy thing of my grandfather kind of buying back these pieces of his own kind of ancestral land. And, you know, this kind of placelessness. You know. Mercedes, um, we don't see your screen. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh warn me. <laughs> I don't know why that turned off. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just like flip through those. Hang on a second. <laughs> if that happens again, interrupt me. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, just a second. I'm gonna go through those really quickly, just so you can kind of see the images I was referring to as I was talking. Um, you know, this is some of the imagery of my grandparents as I remember them. Um, And then, um, sorry, I'm a little, sorry for the quickness of this. Um, and where I was coming to um, is this work I did on, maybe not right now. Thank you, sorry. Thank you. 
Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a four-year-old. We'll get to that later. Um, but with this work I started to do on, on development. Yes, baby, I need to talk now. Um, this work I did on ancestral tribal grounds um, in Los Angeles. And I was working as a cultural consultant in areas that um, where um, Tongva people, my ancestors and their things were being excavated. And this work was very formative for me um, because um, I'm, I'm, I don't, I really apologize. I'm, I don't normally have this. Um, because it was work I did with my father, who was the person you who see your screen again. So, I'm so sorry. What is happening? I literally just did a presentation this morning, and I I really apologize. Um, thank you for that. It, we're all good. Okay. Yes, we are. Okay. So this is my father and Charlie Cook, my father Robert Dormy. And, you know, it was working on these sites where I really started to kind of it have the experiences of one interacting with these objects that spoke of a past. They, um, it was an experience of feeling like um, so much of my, of this, this kind of weight and this burden and responsibility of the ancestors and the culture was on you. It was also a very powerless position because the legal, rec uh, the legal wording is that you're giving recommendations. And so you're kind of carrying this really heavy weight without really having um, a way to kind of work through it. And I find that a lot of my artwork is the process of, of working through some of this experience. And what um, was really, um, what was really, um, I'm so sorry. What was really formative about it is the space we were working in. Um, I don't know. The space we were working in, as this, you know, looking at it in a different light and looking at the objects and the, the, the materials that we were working with. And, and my focus really got focused in on really looking at the surroundings at these kind of materials, the objects. And going through this process was really difficult um, because of the magnitude of it specifically. But I started looking at things like this is kind of one of the images I show because it points to the red yarn um, and why I use that. And all of the sage, the white sage that we use during this process was gifted to us in these um, red yarn bundles. And so when I started to look around and seeing this material as such a um, such a um, remnant of what um, what was left over, and this this image is always kind of one of these important images for me because it speaks to the layers of understanding and trying to kind of make sense of um, one line is a tongue of prayer, a next line is the English translation. And then I have my my dad's handwritten notes on there, which were like notes on how to pronounce something. And I always speak to this image because it was one of these pivotal moments where I was looking at it and I thought, well, I'm looking at this and I, I felt like I was just kind of re, re presenting this idea of the banishing race, right? Like the, the words you're getting washed out. And I was like, I don't want to, do, that's not what I want. I work really hard not to like make stereotypical images and I don't want to even in any way allude to that. But as I was sitting, thinking about it, what I realized was that after going through this process and going through this um, whole experience with the ceremony around the ancestors, that prayer becomes internalized. Um, the words become part of me. And the paper is no longer a necess is no longer necessary. So instead of it being this kind of visual around erasure and disappearance, it became this um, moment of empowerment. And so then I started kind of looking at objects a lot, and I always um, look at this because this I, I I'm kind of like a thrift store junkie. I love getting like 
um, going to flea markets. And um, I found this really kitschy vase and it had this tag on it. And it was, you know, one of those kind of gaudy things, but this tag always really stood out to me because it was, um, it says authentic Indian symbols of the past shown on the back of tag, of, of tag while sometimes used in ceremonials are mainly used for their decorative value. And it was kind of one of these moments where I was like, that is not, like, I'm, I will not allow that. First, there's like this reference to the past. And then it's like, you know, like any native visuals or expression is decorative. And so I was um, kind of really thinking around this idea of what does it mean to kind of have been a part of ceremony? What does it mean to kind of feel a connection with the land, to try to kind of work and reconnect with that? And I started this series that was really in the landscape. And I show this picture because this is my grandparents on my other side. And they bought property in Malibu in the 50s before anyone wanted to live there. And it's right on the like the um what's the right word border I guess of the of my ancestral lands. And so I had access to this hillside, you know, that really didn't change a whole lot. It wasn't developed across from them because of road access. And so it was this space that I grew up playing in. Again, I had access to it for really different reasons. And then what did it mean to explore it um, within the context of, um, of, of this, um, this space? For some reason, my screen share is like totally stalling every couple slides. I really apologize, but I'm just gonna keep going in and out of it to get through um, the images. And so I was looking at these spaces and what does it mean to kind of occupy this space? Um, I really don't know why it's having this issue. <laughs> No uh, worries, you're doing fine. I'm sorry, it's really bizarre. I don't, um, let me try one thing. I wanna see um, if I can do one thing. And I changed one setting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cross my fingers that this fixes it. Um, wait, wait. Okay, we're gonna get there. <laughs> Um, you know, looking at these spaces and looking at other places in Los Angeles that for me reference our culture, reference back, reference forward, reference um, visuals that aren't necessarily um, what people think of of Los Angeles. I mean, uh, what, watering springs where this, um, this is carved out of a boulder, right? And so you're like, you can't one, um, mistake that people were here, one, because it's a, a freshwater spring, right? And so where do people, like, what do people absolutely need to live? It's fresh water, right? And then you see this, this absolutely unmistakable um, impression made by people, you know, a long time ago. And I sometimes, I sometimes think this probably wouldn't exist if, um, it was on a smaller rock because it would be in, you know, somewhere else it would have been moved, but because it's in this huge boulder, um, it's, it remains. And so I like pointing my camera to these moments and these spaces that um, you can see something else and kind of have this undeniable kind of um, interaction. And for me, when I work in spaces where I can return to like this, a lot of times um, the way I feel is it's this, this collaboration with the landscape and the landscape is always changing. It shifts, the animals that move through, um, the way the sun hits, it's always changing. And I, you know, I know in Los Angeles, we don't have super distinct seasons, but you can feel it today. Actually happy equinox, everybody. Um, you can feel fall coming. Like if you if you tune in, your body gets tuned into these spaces and the landscape. And so I looked at a lot of this as um, in my studio. I, I consider the outdoors um, my studio. We were on a good run there, but it stopped again. Um, you know, we were, I, I consider the outdoors my own studio space, which is sometimes awkward in the art world, right? When someone's like, where's your studio? I'm like, well, it's outside. Um, but that's just kind of where I feel like working makes sense. 
And as I've kind of moved through these spaces and kind of worked through them um, with this always changing thing, I started also working in this installation realm, especially with this show at the Hammer. And this was something that was out of my comfort zone. It was bigger in scale. It was using objects. I was making objects. I was casting concrete. This was something that I had never done before. And I just said, you know, I want to do it. And um, I was really inspired by Orion's Belt because growing up in Los Angeles, I'm going to go back one, like that was what I remember seeing in the night sky. And then it's, um, yeah, it's connection to um, East and West and kind of looking at these stars and this kind of impulse to keep looking up and seeing something and reconnecting with what um, what is there. And the other object, um, these are um, the objects that I started to recreate and they're officially called cog stones. I have unofficially renamed them star stones um, just because every time I was saying cog stones in lecture, it kind of just like stuck in me, in my mouth. And so um, these are stones that I actually worked on a site where this was happening. And there are these very incredible intentional objects that we don't know what they were used for. They're specifically found in our tribal area and um, this region. And I always, I, it was always so unimaginable that you would have something that so clearly had a purpose and was so intentionally and really beautifully made, but to not have that um, story. And I use them one because that is indicative of our history. And sometimes it's really hard to grapple with the gaps that exist when you have these pieces. It goes all the way back to that first series of my family of like, there's these gaps in the history or gaps in the narrative that I really wish I could fill in. And so I started to kind of make them myself. And that was kind of a really empowering moment um, because I, wanted to be able to kind of create this um this kind of plane of concrete um here we go it's gonna do it and so i made them myself and i cast them out of concrete and i wanted to use pigment and i kind of wanted to alter them again a, a lot and it was a really challenging but really um kind of rewarding task and then they kind of you know, for me, I made them out of concrete because they have this, like, they make this plane of, um, like, concrete that we all kind of exist in, in this city. And, you know, it's not that far below the ground that so much is there. Um, and I've worked a lot, you know, so, like, this kind of, this first installation kind of, what's the right word, propelled me into a lot of different spaces a lot of different uh, material. This is the show at the De Saize that uh, Pamela mentioned earlier, um, where I was looking at these kind of moments of, of um, interaction with, again, with the landscape. I mean, this was in, in Northern California, you know, San Jose area. And so I always kind of want to reference a bit. So I gathered pine, um, redwood cones on a walk. And I, was, I always try to kind of reference a bit um, where I am, it also was during the winter solstice and um, this kind of these instances of um, eclipses and like this idea of looking up and, and wanting to come together to kind of experience something, to still want that connection with the cosmos. Um, and for me, these, these star stones became a way to kind of map, you know, the first title of the piece from the hammer was a map for moving between worlds. And it's this idea of, of kind of having these anchor points here in this world that you can go, but always kind of have a, a point, a way, a pathway back. Um, and I think a lot of that, um, you know, I, I often struggle with the fact that we don't have sovereign land, that we don't have space to gather, we don't have space to bury our ancestors. And so I look at these moments where I get to work in these spaces and make these installations as having a small piece of Los Angeles for a little while to work in and do kind of these, whatever I want. And I, I know there's always that constraint of the institution that holds the keys really, but that's how I imagine it. Um, and um, 
and say as many can we go one more time and we can And then, um, yeah, this is a larger screen. And then I did this piece at the Autry that was really um, a shift for me because it was interactive and it was really fun and it was more performative. And, you know, I was up on this platform all night and it became really performative in a way that, and, and interactive in a way that I had never um, worked. And I had this idea of creating this kind of constellation of images I took instant pictures of the people who attended that evening and I had them write on what is home. And the thing that was really interesting to me is in my mind, I was making like a physical literal map of places like, a, like a, a, you know, my dad, I remember my dad teaching me how to use a Thomas guide and being like, what is happening? But like, you know, you have these like intersections of lines and, and people and squares and places. And I, it, and instead of it being really a literal map of place, it, um, it was conceptual. People were talking about finding acceptance and, um, you know, ability to be themselves. And all these things about home that, you know, are really more, uh, were really came forward. And I found it really uh, an interesting and really enlightening per, uh, experience. And I kind of have this idea of wanting to somehow get these people, their Polaroids back. And I kind of, um, had this fun moment because they put this placard up with my name and the title of the piece and the didactic. And I was kind of, I, I love uh, the work of James and I think he is, a, is an amazing artist, was an amazing artist. Um, but I kind of had this like James in a moment where I was like standing on this platform doing this strange performance in front of like a plaque of myself. Um, so it was, it was a pretty amazing um, experience. Um, I only have a few slides. I have three or four left. I'm so sorry about the sharing issues. Um, but I have a couple, one more thing I'd like to show, one more piece. And this was um, another installation I worked on recently up in San Francisco. And it was an exhibition that was in conversation with the Carlton Watkins show. And Carlton Watkins was this photographer who photographed Yosemite um, in the early days of photography. And some of his photos are credited with being why um, Congress put that land aside. And so there's this like preservation element that I, I'm like, yeah, that's wonderful. But then when I think about his photographs, the indigenous people of that place were always erased. They were always kind of taken out. And so I found these, I mean, I found these old photographs and postcards I had of Yosemite Valley. And um, I was really working really hard actually to reinsert um, the indigenous presence. And I used, you know, weird, strange, uh, negative images of myself because I just couldn't um, allow, or I didn't want that space to remain void of the native presence. Um, and I kind of really wanted to, create an idea of landscape with these um, black and white um, photograms that were the idea of, of a landscape and this kind of imagination of the stars and the Milky Way and, and um, this idea of the cosmos, but it's all made with cinnamon and feathers. Uh, even the photograms are literally made with cinnamon and feathers and fabric and felt and um, yarn and string. And so I think most of my work and um, a lot of my practice is about reconnection, reconnection to the land, reconnection to ancestral knowledge and reconnection as a community. And I think that that's really important and they are all tied together and all um, vital to, to, I think, you know, where we are and where we need to be. So that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mercedes. That was Welcome. wonderful. I'm going to jump right into introducing um, our next presenter. Um, our next present our next presenter is River Takwi Garza. He is a Los Angeles based artist. Garza is of Tongva and Mexican descent. He is a paddler and the member of the Tiat Society. Garza works Garza's work draws from tradi traditional indigenous aesthetics, Southern California indigenous maritime culture, graffiti, Mexican and low rider culture. 
here is River. Miha, hello, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for, uh, first and foremost, before I get started on the presentation, so I wanna say thank you for everyone dedicating their, or giving their time and energy to this artist talk, listening to myself and Mercedes talk about our work. I'm so, so grateful for all of you being able to join here today. Um, and thank you for the folks at UCLA that put this together. Um, immensely grateful and, and honored to be here just speaking today um, about my work. I guess before I get started, um, actually, can you just pull up the PowerPoint, please? Yeah. Thank you. So I'll do uh, an introduction of myself. I usually, when I do artist talks, go through like a brief chronology of my work. Um, and a little bit of more personal stuff about myself. Um, born and raised, in, well, I was born in Los Angeles, raised in Gardena, California, which is in the South Bay area of Los Angeles. Um, grew up out there. I went to school, college in Pomona, Cal Poly Pomona. Um, but my journey as an artist really began at a, at a young age. I was uh, fortunate enough to grow up in a, in a household uh, where I was encouraged to create art. My mother is a traditional artist and a member of Tiat Society. So at a since I was born, I've been uh, very much immersed in our uh, traditional maritime culture, um, you know, being involved in Tiat society as a young age. And I think it really fostered my sense of understanding and really helped me gain my cultural competence as to who we are as Tongva people, where we're going, and what it means to be, to be a paddler and to be a community member in this way. Um, but yeah, so I mean, growing up just was was really was really amazing. I think you know, growing up in LA, like very urban setting, um, and Gardena is very much a working class community with not a large indigenous presence. So there was a deep contrast of growing up in my you know traditional homelands and knowing you know who my people are and knowing that I live on you know on our home, but you know the surrounding I guess like greater community didn't really know about our people and who we are. But it was it was really grounding just to have you know, folks into Tiat society um, ground me as a kid and just, I think, really inform me who, to, as to who I am. And, um, so, uh, yeah, that really, um, okay, actually, can you go back a few slides? Sorry. Yeah, I'm begin. sorry. It's okay, no worries. Um, Here, sorry. No, it's okay. No, it's no worries. No, no sweat at all. Um, so, yeah, a lot of my early arts encouragement, educa not education, but I was really, uh, yeah, I encouraged at a young age to, to make things. As I mentioned, my mom is a traditional artist. She works on gourds and traditional jewelry. So there were always things around the house. And from when I was a kid, I was always playing around with like paints and whatever my mom had accessible. So um, it was, it was, I was very fortunate in that way. Um, and going through school, I always had an interest in art. I started doing graffiti um, at 11 years old when I was in middle school. So that was, um, you know, a gateway into another form of expression where like I've always had a deep interest in art and I've always known that I wanted to be an artist, but I never knew what that meant, right? Or what that looks like. Because growing up in a working class community, you don't really see artists and we're not, in, a lot of folks like including myself, we're not encouraged to pursue the arts. Um, it always seems so out of reach for whatever reason. But, you know, having my mom's encouragement and exploring what you know outlets and avenues of art were accessible to to myself like graffiti was the main thing um you know growing up in los angeles you see graffiti everywhere street art all over the place and that was what was in my surroundings i think you know especially in in working class communities um there is this you know desire to to create of course but you know having the means to do so and the education isn't always always there to help facilitate the teaching of art and learning art and how to create art so uh, graffiti was one of those things that that was really drawn. I was really drawn to. I think you know, partly because of just the vibrancy and the rawness of the art, but also like deep down, I knew that also reflects like aspects of our traditional culture as well. Like thinking back about petroglyphs and some of the traditional arts that our ancestors create, like that in this way of in its own form is a way of graffiti, I guess. You know, so being drawn to that um, was really was really powerful for me, and it's something that I did for. Um, for a long period of time, I didn't really start making traditional studio art until I was in college, um, my third year in school. So I created, you know, graffiti for all these years and was making art in that way, but never really um, thought about make making tra art traditional or, or fine art. I mean, I have doodled and sketched for for many many years, but I guess it was difficult to 
I don't know, come to a point to get the encouragement that I can create art in this way, right? Um, I, ha I have very little to no formal arts education. So most of, most of what, I, what I know now has been self-taught and, and taught through friends. So I think, you know, just, well, for myself, I, I guess I created this personal barrier that, you know, there had to be some sort of formal arts education in order to create art. But, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a group of friends that were very encouraging me or very encouraging um, to me to create art and start thinking about painting things on canvas. So uh, working with my, my close friends really helped, I think, dismantle this in internalized like imposter syndrome that I, that I can't create art, that I can't be an artist. Um, and all this time I was in school um, majoring in ethnic studies. So at the same time, I think I was also gaining this political, like a political consciousness as well. Um, understanding about contemporary indigenous issues, what's going on, like, and really have, yeah, things were really starting to make sense. Like I, I grew up like within the community and I, I think to a certain point like when I was younger, I almost viewed it passively. Like it was something that was just innate and I knew, and I knew that there were issues like, you know, issues going on within, within my own community. Like this idea of sovereignty, right? Didn't really make sense until I was older and the inherent lack thereof. So, um, but while I was receiving my education at Cal Poly Pomona, like interacting with wonderful mentors, Dr. Sandy Dixon was um, very big and, you know, helping me really understand these things um, from a conceptual point of view, right? So that slowly started translating into me pr producing artwork and that's kind of where I, where I, where I am now. Um, this piece right here is uh, a lot of, I think what, what much of my work embodies, I see it somewhat as like a cultural commentary. It's really me just talking about you know, like a snapshot in time, right? Or what I, how I view like certain events, I think, you know, growing up as a California indigenous person, as a Tongva person, California native, like, um, I don't know, it's very interesting and complex upbringing, like especially in Los Angeles, you know, we're such a huge city with a large um, population of different indigenous folks from all kinds of communities that we share this space together, right? But within, I guess, like the greater population, there's, I think there, there's an inherent lack, there, like lack of knowledge about our people, our ancestors, where, where we, who we are, you know, in a historical and contemporary context. So I think a lot of what my work embodies is how I, I experience this as, as a Tongva person, really. Um, but yeah, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, a lot of my early work, um, very much is, is uh, very much a lot of like collage based work. Um, it was very insightful and wonderful to hear Mercedes talk about her work. I see a lot of parallels, um, but definitely like a lot of what I was doing when I was first starting to create art was making uh, these, these collage based pieces. A lot, and I was using a lot of like photos and documentation of, um, of things relating to, you know, our, our well, my Tonga history, my, my family's history as indigenous people to this land. So there's pictures of my grandmother, my great grandmother, and so on and so forth. And documents interacting with um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs that my, my grandfather sent many, many years ago inquiring about, you know, just, I guess, inquiring about who we are as people, as Tonga people. But a lot of these, like, I just had these access to these documents for so many years. And um, it wasn't really until I was in college that they started to make sense, right? This idea of documentation, how, you know, the federal government has classified us, how we view ourselves. And I don't know, it's just very, very interesting. And I guess like me really just trying to explore this. Like, what does it mean to be, a, I'm not a Tongva person, but what does that look like? Like, I don't know. And I think just accessibility to, to art as well, right? Like there's not that much art by from our community out there that's accessible. So I think part of that journey of, you know, creating things was also like, you know, what can art for my community look like, right? I think there's, in, in many ways, um, I don't know, I guess like, it was just a, re a really interesting and introspective journey of viewing these these photographs, right, of my ancestors, the people that, you know, that, that come before me who play such a big role into as to who I am now and why, I, why I'm here. And that really, uh, embodied a lot of my early work, a lot of collage based pieces similar to what you see on the left. And I, and then slowly, I think I started gravitating more towards what you see on the right, which is a kind of an amalgamation of like abstract figures and incorporating aspects of what I see as like graffiti lettering and also, um, you know, traditional, traditional symbols like petroglyphs and, um, but yeah, I think 
I don't know, a lot of that early work was like collage based. And I think why I gravitated more towards collage at that time was this, um, this feeling that I couldn't like paint, if that makes any sense. Like, I don't know, for some, some reason, like painting seemed like so grandiose of a, not say of a task, but like, I don't know, I think of like the, the painters that came before me, right? There's so many, so many greats. And I think like embarking on that was like such, to me, was like such a strenuous task. Like, wow, if I want to be, be a painter, like there's a certain standard, right? And creating work that I feel is up, up to that standard and, and really articulate something that I feel is, is meaningful. So uh, the, the process of, of me learning how to paint was, was uh, difficult, but luckily I've been able to encounter mentors along the way. Um, but yeah, it was really hard for me to, to, to paint for whatever reason, like the collage based stuff, like kind of came naturally when I was like a teenager in high school, I'd make little funky collages out of like National Geographic's and whatever, Thrasher Skateboard magazines. So I was kind of used to that, but again, like this idea of painting was like, wow, like, can I do this? And I, and I slowly did. And I think a lot of what I have been painting is really very, very much introspective and yeah, I don't know, I guess delving more into myself as opposed to, um, uh, I can honestly like analyzing my ancestors, but like focusing more on that, if that makes any sense. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Thank you. Where is that? Okay, I don't know why it's not going. Oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll continue to, to speak anyhow. But, oh, there we go. Okay. Wonderful. So the, the piece to the left, um, if we all can can see it well, is like this a abstract head form. It's kind of, uh, I don't know, all, all over the place, really. I think it encompasses aspects of like, the, you know, the quote unquote, pan Indian culture, pan indigenous culture, right, of here in the United States, but also things that are very temporal and specific to Los Angeles. Um, you see, there's the words Momarijico scrawled above the the head of the figure right there, which is the name of our Tiat in, in, uh, <clears throat> within Tiat society. And there's this brief little map of Los Angeles up top and a reference to the American Indian movement. So this was created during a time where, um, like I had mentioned, I was in school and I think really starting to, you know, create this political consciousness of understanding what it means. Like, you know, the indigenous, I think the indigenous identity or, or for, for me, at least, is, is inherently political, right? Like reading authors like Vine Deloria Jr. and um, Taiki Alfred and, uh, oh man, I can't, her name is slipping my mind, but she wrote Decolonizing Methodologies. So the authors like that, and right, these types of, these types of work are really influencing, you know, what I wanted to create visually. Like I was writing a lot and um, yeah, writing a lot in school. And I think creating stuff that kind of parallel that was what a lot of my early work um, was talking about. And the work to the left is a play on the American Spirit uh, Tobacco Company. I think for a long period of time, before I started creating creating work, um, you know, I've always struggled with this, this with the, the consumption and commodification of our culture and especially our, our, our spirituality and items that pertain to our, you know, our spiritual culture. You know, and tobacco for many of our, our tribes, including my own tribe, is a traditional and sacred plant. So to see not only the caricature that has been embodied in this, you know, mass market tobacco program or tobacco product, but just even the fact that tobacco is even, you know, market, sold as a marketable good is always like, I've always struggled with that. And I think it kind of relates to the way that we see, you know, sage being sold and other, you know, traditional medicinal items being sold as a marketable good is always, I've always deeply like struggled with that. And I don't know. So this is really just a, a, a play on that on, um, yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so these these pieces right here, this is another powwow piece. This was the, the first one. You saw the the second piece that I created um, in on the, the title page. But this one right here is again kind of talking about the I guess this influence of the pan indigenous culture and also how I view things as a California indigenous person. Um, I don't know, it's just really, really interesting how I think, you know, California native folks experience uh, these cultural events like powwows, right? Like so much of it isn't indicative and representative of our traditional culture, but it's still like one of these events that, you know, I've like gone to throughout my entire life. And I'm sure many native folks have gone to, especially 
that grew up in, in urban and rural settings. So it's one of these things that are so familiar. And I think like, I don't know, at the time I was being <laughs> taking a, a critical eye towards things and I don't know, kind of just challenging and question like what is going on in these spaces, right? And how do I fit in in these spaces? How does my community fit in? Or how don't we fit in, right? So just kind of analyzing these types of things, um, but also to be cheeky and funny and, about it. And I think that's one way it's a, if I'm going to be not necessarily critical, but examine things to be to be like to use humor as a as a tool has always been big for me. But again, I see this as like a, a snapshot in time, right? Like kind of talking about um, yeah, a period of time that exists and maybe things won't exist in, in the future. Like look how we're living life right now. So maybe this thing in captures one one period of time, but that's kind of how I view things. And the piece to the right is kind of this amalgamation of different different words. And I think like, I don't think, but different symbolism, right? I see it as like a, to me is very, very much reminds me of like 1960s road signs. Like if you've driven through the Southwest or to, through, yeah, going to like from California to like New Mexico down the 10 or whatever it may so be. You see all of these like different advertisements for, for native goods and being sold. Like, I don't know, it's just very interesting experiences stuff and how just our, our culture is marketed by, you know, outside entities in our own community within itself so um and it, one of the main i guess like the focal point you see in this painting and what kind of recurs throughout a lot of my work is this though the phrase like spirituality for sale um and again i think that ties back to the commodification and consumption of, of our culture and especially our, our, our spiritual goods so something that i've always just, just struggled with and kind of um yeah i think the the play on text here, like a lot of words really comes from my, my background doing graffiti, I think. Like a lot of paintings and artwork, or artwork in general, some things can be left for interpretation, right? Depending on the viewer, how we examine things. But the, when I, for me, at least when I use words, things are, to me, it's like very, it's a very direct way of communicating an idea or a concept. So that's kind of um, where, yeah, that piece is informed and comes from. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? And this, this work was produced in, in 2018. So you kind of see a gradual evolution and um, I, at least I do a continuation of the style and really, I guess at this point in time, very, very analytical examining what's going on. And um, in 2018 was the first time I experienced the Santa Fe Indian market. So I think during this time, uh, you know, for myself, I was, I don't know if this makes any sense, but um, like, I guess embracing the identity of an artist that like owning that yes I am an artist like I think it's for a long time I don't know if this makes any sense to other folks but you know like creating art is one thing but like saying like yes I'm an artist was like some something different and it's something that I don't know I guess against again a certain sense of responsibility like what does it mean to be an artist and these are the things that you know introspectively I'm thinking about but yeah so like I guess at this point in time like uh, yeah, I guess approaching the world as an artist and, and owning what that means, right, as like a as, a, as an identifier for myself, but it was really interesting going to the Santa Fe, in, Santa Fe Indian market, which is, um, you know, huge in the native art world, to say the very least. Um, it's a huge economic driver for the state of New Mexico, and it's, oh, you know, so many, so many fabulous artists show, show their work, and um, I don't know, but I think this relate again, this relationship of like, what is like this relationship of commodification is what it really comes down to, right? As artists, how we, you know, sell and market our goods, how we, you know, sustain our, our lifestyle as an art, or not a lifestyle, but a life as a working artist becomes really challenging in, in some of these spaces. And I think the Santa Fe Indian market is one of these places, right? Where, you know, the although the attraction is to come see the native art and experience, you know, native artwork and all the different events that go on at the end of the day i think like you know the the industries that are invested in, in tourism like the hotels and all of these folks are they're, they're the ones who are who are really making money but at the expense of, of artists at, at least i view it that way so i think there's this you know this inherent struggle of i don't know it's, i think it's really complicated um to be an artist in these spaces right to you know, not want to co commodify your creations and all the time, but at the same time, it's a way to like earn, earn a living. It's, I don't know, it's, I just think it's really complicated. Um, and I, and that's something that I at least struggle with. And I see other people um, struggle with as well, you know? Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just really challenging to me to see, to see like native folks, like, you know, it's complicated because I know native folks, like artists that work that exhibit their work in this, like this is like the, the bread and butter for, for many people where they're able to make 
you know, enough money to help sustain them through the year. So it's, it's so critical and key. But at the same time, like the people that are there, the art patrons, like most of them are native folks. They're not folks from the community. A lot of, it's a lot of the times, like it's, um, you know, wealthy white folks with money that want to buy some, some native art. So I think, you know, I, I struggle with that too. Like for me, I think except that ties into the idea of accessibility, right? And as an artist, I've always wanted my work to be accessible to, to folks within my, my own community. So I don't know, it's just re really complicated because again, it, it, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough being an artist and, and navigating these spaces and how, how to make a living. Um, but yeah, it's just really interesting and observing that for the first time um, was, was really, yeah, really eye opening um, to see the performative aspects of certain things that go on with an Indian market that I don't think would normally go on in other circumstances was um, compelling and eye opening and also just the beautiful work that exists there and a lot of things that, that may or may not get overlooked right. But it's, an, it's a whole experience. Um, and this piece, I think, encapsulates some of what I was feeling during that time, during my, my first time visiting. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Thank you. And this is another piece, I think, just, just being cheeky um, and toying with that. The, I guess the idea of presentation, right? Like, what do, who are we as, as Native artists? Like, what does it mean? What, is, what does this look look like, right? And especially, like, going to a place like Santa Fe, I think, like, you know, the Billy Jack hats are very prominent. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. And again, I think during the time when I was creating this, like, I didn't have that internal validation that I was an artist, right? So I think struggling with that, like, what does it mean? What do artists look like? And if I were walking down the street, would people think that, you know, number one, am I an indigenous person or am I an artist? Like, I don't know, just this idea of, of self-presentation, right? And I was also reading <laughs> Irving Goffman at the time. So it, a lot of this really made sense, um, the presentation of self, but yeah, really, really interesting. But I think I just, you know, these little cultural commentaries I've seen to be to be funny about it, right? Um, yeah, humor as a as a tool. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. All right. So this uh, piece right here is a mural I did in collaboration with uh, Pueblo artist Jake Fragua and Indian Alley. I was fortunate enough to come in contact with. Um, Steven Ziegler and Jody Ziegler who are now running the space through wonderful Pamela Peters. So this, um, this piece right here is a um, map of Los Angeles and it has uh, on the left are, is, is a map of traditional village sites. So uh, um, that's, that's really what you see there is a map of LA. Um, I chose to um, put the traditional village sites in our traditional language as, a, as like a tool, as a marker, right? I think for so many people, they don't know, like, they don't know as intuitive as it may seem that, you know, Los Angeles is and once home to, you know, village sites for, from our from our people. So, um, and in a place like Indian Alley, I think this type of, of piece is really important because it gets visitors from all kinds of different tribal communities. And I think it's one visual tool that people can, can use to kind of better understand the space and really understand the names that, that are a part of this land, right? Um, and the caricatures that you see to the right and kind of you know, intersect or interweaving across are done by, by Jake, really interesting, kind of also encapsulates this idea of, of a map. But yeah, I really wanted to just expose people as to, to our village sites, like where we are, where we come from and the land that people may live on or may be visiting. Um, but at the same time, like, Belbos is a piece of art I also wanted, because I know like the history of Indian Alley in many ways in the past was very much traumatic. It was a space of community, but it also is in the heart and depths of Skid Row. So there's a lot of, um, you know, traumatic and tragic things that have happened in and around this space. So part of, for me, um, in creating this piece, I also wanted to leave an offering as well. So on the on the top part of the mural, it's kind of hard to see because um, it's so far away, but there's barbed wire along the top, the top and I tie tobacco ties up there. So that's, that's to leave an offering. I mean, it's like indeed a mural, but also somewhat, I guess, an installation in that way. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's also, I also embedded like different types of, of shell and shell mint into the wall. So kind of also reflecting our maritime and my our maritime culture and my connection to Tiat society in the ocean. This is a really wonderful uh, piece. And I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to create this. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Thank you. And here's um, some more recent work. This, the piece to the left is a serigraph I did in collaboration with Self-Help Graphics. 
Um, and this one is very, very much reflective of my connection uh, to Tiat society. And you see the word Momarijico uh, scrawled across the top and all over, which means breath of the ocean in our language. And you see this um, kind of crisscross pattern, these triangles to me, that's very reflective of um, our, our basketry and much of our traditional art. Um, so it's very big influence in mine. And you see images of community, our community members at Cindy Alvitri at the bottom. And I also interweaved some of the old flyers um, from like the, like the late nineties when these events were happening. So it's a really interesting piece. And I was very grateful to, to create that with the help of, um, you know, print masters. And the piece to the right is a piece that I made when I was uh, a graduate student um, at CSUN major, uh, studying sociology. So I think part of this is like, a, 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 um, you know, a continued iteration of what I've already been creating, but me struggling with the fields of sociology. And really, I think like Western academia as a whole, um, where we fit in as an, or I fit in as an indigenous person, as a California native versus a Tonga person. Um, like the field of, you know, sociology is, is very much Eurocentric. Um, and yeah, so I think just like for me, that was like just a major struggle, like reading a bunch of texts from like a bunch of, I hate to say this, but like a bunch of old dead white guys where a lot of what they're writing about doesn't really make sense to, to me right now as a native person. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of this is just really struggling with that. It says like Karl Marx can't teach this. And I think what I mean by that is a lot of, uh, you know, they can break, break down the, the rise and proliferation of, of capitalism, but a lot of that doesn't really relate to like the spiritual side or, you know, what, how our culture as a native people. And so much of that is left out at the academy. And I really struggle with that. And I did as a student. So I think um, part of that is mean, you know, negotiating what it means to be a student in the academy and um, yeah, really studying sociology and these, these type of, uh, these fields of study. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so this piece right here is um, a piece I made for, for We Rise. The, I, the idea, the concept behind it is like a snapshot of what mental health looks like in Los Angeles. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's a you know, mixed media piece. I think it's kind of all over the place, but very much centered on, yeah, for me, like what does it mean to be a Tonga person? What does mental health look like? I think so like for, for many folks and even myself at times I may lose sight that, you know, Los Angeles is traditional and sacred land. So I think it's just, to me, this is like a gentle reminder of that um, in, in many ways, but also touching upon different issues across, you know, native country and also deeply tied again to the commodification and consumption of our culture. I just think it was really, really interesting and, and compelling and tried to weave in different aspects of LA and also how, you know, we represent, how we represent ourselves and, um, yeah, how the, I guess how outsiders view us as well. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And this is an, another piece I created uh, last year titled Borders. Um, it's a mixed media piece. It has uh, spray paint, paint, acrylic. There's there's wire like aluminum wire fencing in there that's tied on with red yarn. So um, this is really talking about the issue at, at the border right now, right? Which has been ongoing for so many years and really just, I guess, struggling with, well, yeah, what, what's, what's going on. And, um, right, right there in the text, it says like borders are a colonial construct, which I did, which I think they are, are indeed right in the past. They were just a line in the sand that was, you know, respected upon by different communities, but they've become now a point of political, economic, and cultural contention. So I think struggling with that, right. We see tribal communities that are split because of these borders when in the past, um, these things didn't exist. So it's really, really to me, struggling with that. And also there's, um, like screen printed in there is the def like the dictionary definition of a border and a, a quote by Gloria Anzaldúa on the bottom talking about borders right um what it means and to the right is like a, a, a thing I pasted from like an old um like <laughs> history textbook from like the 1970s so this piece talking about explorers and I think it's um talking about land and borders over there I can't see it I can't remember it's kind of far but also there's a at the top a mention to it says like uh Caravaggio don't know shit about this and Caravaggio is a western or is a, is a renaissance painter and yeah so to me like you know 
being an artist, being part of it is like understanding and studying art history. And these, a lot of what these old artists are talking about is just totally irrelevant in many ways. And I think I <laughs> struggle with that too, is connecting to, you know, some of these older Renaissance artists and what is deemed the great canon of art, right? And part of that, is, um, you know, I get going away from that and um, really, for, for me, like really gravitating more towards like, you know, native artists, folks that are, have done contemporary work and in the past, like um, Mercedes mentioned James Luna, who's one of my favorite artists. Um, just uh, just amazing, right? And coming across artists like Rick Bartow and uh, from like Charlene Teeter and Fritz Scholder and all these amazing artists that have, that have done work um, both in performance and in painting as well. So I think like, you know, a lot of the times I do struggle with relating to, to Western artwork, like especially in museums, right? A lot of contemporary native artwork isn't really shown and you're seeing these so-called masters of the past, but you know, a lot of our people have created such beautiful work that we don't really get to see that exhibited. So um, yeah, I think that's me analyzing and deconstructing that. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So these are some more recent works. Um, and I think like, as of late, a lot of what I've been creating has been, uh, well, I guess I'll start with the piece to the left. So the piece to the left is Custer's last portrait. Um, again, right, this Custer is this uh, person, this character we've come become so familiar with. And um, yeah, I just wanted to create some that is his last portrait because he didn't make it. Uh, and right there, it's like a reference to write these figures, these cultural events that pertain, I think, to like the larger us as indigenous people, right, as, as not assuming as Tongva person, but the pan-Indian culture, if that makes any sense, um, tying to that, but also bringing in like influence, like random influences of things that I like. So right there, there's, it says Cowboys to Girls, which is a reference to a song by the Intruders. Like I love old, like oldies and old school music. So I think a lot of what I've been creating also interweaves my own influences and what I, what I like and love. And the piece to the right, I think is very much representative of that. Um, John Coltrane is one of my favorite musicians and yeah, I just wanted to make a piece to to honor to honor John Coltrane, and so yeah, I think like a lot of my work is very much draws on you know my culture as as a Tongva person, but also I think more as of late, a lot of my own personal and in, personal interest as well, and kind of exploring that in my work. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, these pieces right here um, also created rather recently. And the piece to the left is called Johnny Depp Indian Warrior. And I created it right after the um, Dior Sauvage campaign came out, which I'm sure many of you have seen and was troubling to say the very least. So um, a lot of the times when I create these pieces, like it's, you know, the content kind of just presents itself. So for me, it's just kind of, again, talking about a moment in time and these kind of funny things that I think happen um, within Indian country, right? So. I don't know, it's like, again, I want to, I guess at times provide critique, but also be, be funny about it, right? And, and present that critique in a humorous way. And the piece to the right is an homage, a portrait of, of James Luna, who I mentioned is one of my favorite artists. So um, just, I did an artist residency at, in Santa Fe at the Institute of American Indian Arts uh, last year. And they have such an amazing library there. I was able to look through books and really delve uh, deeper into to James Luna's work. And left um Santa Fe very much inspired by just yeah just his work the way he 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 thinks and thought about things um so yeah this is an homage to him uh just really amazing uh can you go to the next slide please and just briefly uh, brush through these but this is a continuation of that capitalist spirit painting series um these are some more paintings I ended up doing eight of them for a exhibit that was supposed to open in in Italy for a, a solo exhibit that got pushed back due to uh, the coronavirus. So, but I just wanted to show, show you some more work that I've been working on recently, it's a continuation of that, playing on the idea of, of repetition, right? And uh, yeah, can you go to the next slide? Get through things, I won't take up too much time. So as I mentioned, um, as of late, I think, well, for, for me, it's been very difficult to create um, during the time of coronavirus, during this pandemic, uh, just so much has gone on and I think you know, the, the greater cultural, but within my own personal life as well, it's been very hard to find, you know, inspiration and talking about certain things. I think like so much of the work I showed you was kind of like a critical examination of things. But for me, like, I don't know, it doesn't feel like the time or place for that. And yeah, just going through a lot of personal adversity. And I think like finding the inspiration and 
what I want to create has just really drawn to me, like creating things that I love these days or, or references to things that I love. Like I'm, uh, as you saw in the John Coltrane piece, that's like a reference to the music that I, you know, admire. And for myself, like I'm a big time sports fan as, you know, corny and cliche as it, as it may be, but I, I do love sports and um, there's a, so uh, yeah, there's, this is an image of, of Kobe Bryant to, to the left and homage to him who also passed away earlier this year. Um, and the image to the right is a picture of uh, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant playing basketball. Uh, but yeah, I think these images are a lot more lighthearted and kind of just where some of my more recent work has, has been heading towards. Um, yeah, I think I've just been in a space where I just want to create things that, that I love and just reflecting on, I guess, like moments in time that are a little bit more, more happy to like look back upon. But um, yeah, this is just kind of some of the things that I've been creating as of late. This is a ink on paper. So um, a little bit different than painting, but still in the same realm. Uh, but yeah, it's just been been very, very interesting and challenging to create during this time for, for me and been trying to, you know, prompt myself and push myself in different ways to, to be able to still continue to create despite all all, all that's going on. Um, but yeah, that's about it that I all that I have to share. Um, thank you all for for listening and taking the time. Appreciate it. Wow. Thank you, guys. Um... Thank you, Mercedes and River, for bringing with us today and familiarizing us, our audience, with the rich culture of Tavangar, um, and also of your 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 people, the Tongva people. Um, I do have a few questions um, that I just wanted to um, ask both of you, and then I'll open it up to other questions. Um, I wasn't able to see the chat because I had the screen up. So um, I'll look through that after. Um, I just have, I'll just ask you maybe two quick questions as um, Tongva artists. Um, I love how you both incorporate your culture into your artwork in different, in different ways. Um, with Mercedes, I like how you connect um, the, the red yarn as a connection is there is there like a significant meaning behind the red yarn connecting yeah so it started um from that image i showed where it was this material remnant of the um, reburial process and it was just kind of everywhere it was super present it was a kind of this impactful visual um, and it was there because it was what was tying um, the medicine, the sage, right? And so it kind of had this um, really kind of important uh, function, but was also a kind of leftover. So it, it, that was when it really kind of started getting to my consciousness as a material. Um, and when I started using it actually was in this process where I was creating these meter squares which were also a reference to the work that I had experienced um, in observing as a cultural consultant observing archaeological work where these strings are created with nails into the earth. So it's basically like the earth and then you kind of make a square on top of it and that's like the mode of exploration. And so I started thinking of this conceptually as a um, like pointing to something in order for an exploration to happen. And then it kind of went up off the ground because those were down on the floor. And it simultaneously was thinking through this idea of sinews and again, referencing how kind of messy and nonlinear our history and narrative can be um, and, and what it means to fill in those things. Because like sinews in a body, right? They connect your, they make your body function, but it's not like a straight line. But the kind of messiness and intertwinedness and intersections are what make it actually um, stronger is what I was kind of thinking around. And then as they kind of came up off the ground, it was to reference um, like an imagination of space. When I did that first um, installation at the Hammer Museum that was larger in scale than I had been working and, and the circle came into play it was kind of referencing this idea of a circular yova, which is a ceremonial space. So it's, it's 
and then also to reference this beam of light that came in during installation um, when I was painting that plinth, you could kind of see it in that one image. So it's kind of to spark the imagination, to get the viewer to look up. And then again, like with that installation in the Autry, it also is this like intersections, these coordinate points, these kind of meeting spaces, this kind of intersection of people and places and land and time and culture. And that also is kind of non-linear, non, -linear, non um, you know, sometimes we like to bake these timelines and there's like a straight line with little dots on it. I actually tried to do one for myself recently for another presentation. And I was like, this is odd, you know, like I can't do this. It's, the, it's not linear, it's cyclical, these intersections of people and time and place. Even Pamela, when you and I met was kind of randomly, they put us at a bed and breakfast. We were both <laughs> like, I guess we're having breakfast together, but it turned out to be wonderful. And we kind of had this moment of, of meeting and spending time and walking and talking. And, and those are kind of those really special moments um, that I feel like you kind of have to hold on to. And it's like this idea that that red yarn, I usually use just one piece, right? And it's like that idea of cr crossing paths again, or that intersection happening, and maybe the meaning is different at that time, but um, kind of just that potential that yeah, I kind of see it too as like the veins of like the connection of your ancestors connecting you to all these different objects from that's kind of what I see from my perspective. But I love what you share about just the connection with with the yarn. Yeah, and the sinews kind of plays into that. Uh, you know, maybe like you're right, veins is another idea. Um, but yeah, when you think of like um, yeah, the connective tissue, like it sounds kind of scientific or anatomical, but it, it's so important, like those heartstrings, you know, that's just part of Yeah, what well, that's one thing that really drew me to your exhibit when I saw it, the red yarn, I was like, wow, this is really beautiful. And that's kind of what I interpret when I saw it initially. But um, now I can view it in a total different perspective as well. Um, River, you, you use a lot of different um, pop culture images in your, in your collages of work. Um, how, how, do you, how do you manage that? Um, is it like a visual, like, cause I see, there's a visual storytelling I see but how do you manage to get like these images? I mean, what, what inspires you? Um, it's a great question. And I think I, I as cliche as it may sound, I mean, hearken it to like the way jazz musicians improvise in certain ways. And they've, I guess, embraced the moment. Like a lot of the random pop cultural references or whatever you may see in this work is really inspired of what, like what I'm doing and creating during that time. So when you see, references of music or, or films or even um, literature as well. So I, mean, I think a lot of what I'm doing is influenced by what I'm reading, what I'm watching or listening to. So I think that's where a lot of that comes from. Um, and kind of just this amalgamation of all these things, I think is very representative of, of who I am and kind of like the eclectic interest <laughs> that I have. Um, but yeah, it really just comes to what I'm doing. Like if I'm listening to a good song, like Ooh, I'm gonna put the title of the song in that or a little lyric that I like or I like this portion of a movie or this this phrase from a movie um, or, or a book or a poem. And it kind of goes yeah. like that. Yeah, I kind of started doing that with, with movies. Like I, I started watching a lot of different movies and if there's like some reference or some dialogue that has a, some native um, reference, I usually will record it and keep it. And I, I eventually want to do something with it, but I'm not too sure. But I like the way you do that. And, your um your artwork thank you um yeah with mercedes and river um this is kind of a packed question um the term cultural property seems to be like the big hot topic in the art world um and i wanted to know if you can share your perspective of what it means to you as a native person and why it's important for native artists. We can start with you, Mercedes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like crazy sunbeam, 
trying. I, it looks beautiful on you. <laughs> I started talking about the light beam. And I, and I was like, what is this? You got a new stage now. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so it's interesting because I feel like in my academic art training, going to fine art grad school in San Francisco, um, often I was criticized for not coding as native enough, right? And so I always find this interesting thing happening, being of Los Angeles, which is a huge cultural producer, right? Kind of created, you know, is, not exactly the birthplace of Hollywood, but where Hollywood is, right? And the kind of cultural identity as what looking or being native is came from Hollywood for a lot of people, right? A lot of people's conception of what that's supposed to be comes from there. And then, so it's kind of this strange thing of trying to reshift um, the visuals or reshift the lens and, and kind of, play with this idea of what actually is native. And so for me, a lot of um, a lot of what I'm kind of working around is even just um, bringing the visibility to the cultural codes that might not be as recognizable. I don't know if that's quite talking to this idea, but like when I think of, um, patterns and um, weavings and basketry. Um, like we have things that I recognize, but it's not necessarily what's being appropriated because it's actually not necessarily quite mainstream. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. So it's kind of, I mean, obviously I think that there's a, an amazing shift. There's a lot of talk about appropriation and what that means and, and, um, and um, who gets to tell the story, right? I mean, when I was in grad school, this conversation wasn't happening. Now, when I'm teaching now in a grad program, it's absolutely happening. And I think mm -hmm. that that's an amazing shift of like, you know, who gets to tell the story and who gets to like tell their own story and claim that narrative. And I feel like art production and culture production kind of all falls within that, um, that same thing. Yeah. And what about for you, River? Well, to be fully clear and transparent, I don't, I, this is the first time I've come across that term, so I don't exactly know what it means. Um, it, it basically just means um, who, who owns, who is the uh, author of work from a tribe, like culture consulting, um, you know, I, I think, it can, it can mean like who owns, is it, is it specifically, if it's specifically for a tribe and then that artwork can only specifically be for that tribe. I see. Oh, I, I don't know. I guess that's a, I don't know. I complicate to say the very least, um, but something that I guess we all, well, not we all, but definitely as, a painter, something you know, something that I think we or I struggle with at least in terms of I don't know, like so is the idea of who can tell a story, who's is that story valid? Does that make any sense? I don't yeah, know. well I think like, you know, there's there's laws like for art, um mm -hmm. for artists and to protect their designs, their history, their their storytelling. Um we, you know, like for instance, like for, for Navajo people, like a corporation can't really take our name, Navajo and brand it on um, products. They tend to, but we have a, um, we can go out and, and sue them because we have protection of that. That's our cultural property. It's to identify who we are as a, a tribe. And, you know, it's 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 become a hot topic just because it's there's a lot of there's a lot of corporations there's a lot of you know um, writing and um, screenplays that have 
incorporated other tribes without their knowledge and they're taking um, ownership of it. And that's really what it's, that's what I'm pertaining to. Um, it, it, it's, it, I know it's a really packed question and it, it, it has a ton of layers to it, but do you feel that it's important for you through the work that you do? Um, in, important at, in the regards to me telling our, our own authentic narrative, if that makes any sense? Yes. Yeah, I, I think it is. And I think, you know, it's, it becomes complicated because I think there is this desire to, you know, understand more about Tonka people, other tribal nations, right? And a lot of that may be done through, through media or other, maybe, yeah, through media, whatever it may so be. And in that, you know, process of creating these ideas, maybe some things get lost in the way, but I don't know. It is, it's, it's very complicated. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, right, what little sovereignty, you know, I guess like tribal communities like Tongan folks do have is this idea of visual sovereignty and be able to tell and cultivate our own stories in a way that makes that makes sense as authentic. Um, but who has rights to that, I think will always be up to up to contention because maybe some things, you know, folks may, may feel is more profane and some things may feel more sacred. So I think what that line is, is, is hard to discern um, to say the very least, but I don't know, I guess like for artists, it is part, not our, our job, but is a part like a, a task to be able to decipher this, you know, this fine line of what is what is appropriate and what isn't and who can authentically tell a story. And what, I don't know, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a complicated um, um, question to ask because it varies from different, I think from different communities because, um, you know, I think be because of pan-Indianism, um, there was a lot of exchange of different cultural practices as well. And mm -hmm. especially here in Los Angeles, um, it's integrated with a lot of different tribes and we share, but then who has the authority to, you know, create those stories going forward. And I think sometimes we, it, it does become um, problematic and it becomes an issue. Um, for me, for instance, I, I get encountered by writers um, to basically saying, is this okay? Because it's an Indian story. And, it's, and if it's identified from, not from my tribe, I can't say. And I, you know, I tell them to go to that particular tribe. It's, it is really complicated, but I think it's also important for us as native people to, you know, um, respect the other tribes and give them the opportunity to, to, you know, share their stories authentically from, from their community. And so that kind of goes into my next question is like, how as a Tongva tribal member, are you able to navigate and be visible in a city like Los Angeles that's, um, you know, has a lot of urban Indians. Mercedes, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, well, first, I, you know, one thing I did want to mention is like, I think a good example that might resonate is like the white sage. This is to your last question. Yeah. It's kind of become this practice. You can go to, um, it, it's been kind of used by a lot of different people in a lot of different places, right? But it's actually very specific geographically. Um, to the region, right? And so there's a lot of these campaigns against maybe it being sold at like, you know, world market or cost, whatever, you know, like these stores, it's like, you know, you're like kit that you can buy at some, you know, um, box store or whatever, because of the, you know, concerns around endangerment of the species and the way it's being harvested. And so I think that for me is like a Tonga person is one of those areas where like um, there is an interesting conversation around that. As for navigating a city um, like Los Angeles, I mean, I grew up here. I went to UCLA undergrad. I spent a lot of time um, and then I left and I, 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 I appreciate Los Angeles a whole lot more every time I come back or every time I get to spend time outdoors there and I feel like it always feels like home. 
Um, at the same time, I often feel like a trespasser. Um, wow. <laughs> I get like kind of enraged when I see private beach signs in Malibu. It makes me crazy. Like one day I was walking through a parking lot and a guy kind of came out. I thought it was public. I thought I was trying to walk to a doctor's office and he comes out and says like, this is private property. And it, it enraged me. Like it really, and I was like, whoa, why did that upset me so much? You know, like I, I had this like literal gut reaction. I was so upset by it. And I kind of um, sat and I thought about it. And I was like, it's, it's, it's so absurd what that even means, you know? Yeah. And there's, when you look at how like the, uh, just like, I mean, all the, the land politics, right? So it's, it's a, it's a strange feeling that I have in the city simultaneously feeling super connected and also like there's like a layer of dissection or a layer of feeling like never quite at ease. Um, and that's, I think that feeling I've had my whole life and it's taken me a lot of years to kind of work through it. And maybe that's part of why I make, you know, the art in the landscape because it's it processing. A lot of my work is processing through these kind of experiences I grew up with watching my grandparents and what they went through. My father, what he's gone through um, other tribal community people, um, you know, um, kind of that dissection, that conceptual mental, like psychological dissection from a place that, really like it has a visceral like I feel a visceral connection with and sometimes I don't know exactly how to explain that but it's yeah amazing. so and what about you for river um we're running out of time so um this is probably going to be my last question I apologize we can't get into any questions but you guys did a phenomenal job um if river if you just want to respond to that really quickly Sure, sure. I'll make it snappy. Um, I think what initially comes to mind is like an inherent duality, if that makes any sense. Um, like as Mercedes was saying, like being so connected to this land, but at least for me, I think there's like this inherent disconnect to like the urban sprawl, right, of what I see around, like knowing the history of the land, what, you know, what's here still exists now, just I don't know, it's complicated. And I think like, especially like growing up in like a working class community, it's like the economic isolation of certain places. I think was it's, it's complicated too right like knowing that you know los angeles is probably one of the most expensive places to to live in and not having access to certain spaces right um whether it be because of private interests or um commercial interests commercial property but i think i think that's what what is what is difficult in, in navigating but also taking the chance to relish what spaces like community spaces still do exist right like thinking about um how important, you know, preserving the land at Pavuna is and being able to access a place like Kurvunga Springs are things that I think provide some solace for me. You'll still be able to go to the beach as crowded and polluted and crazy as it may be. But um, yeah, that's, that's what comes to mind. Okay. Well, thank you so much for you guys um, for sharing the wonderful work, um, the rich culture and understanding a little more about Tavangar, otherwise known as Los Angeles. And um, I'm going to close and I would like to remind everybody that this Friday is California Native American Day, a state holiday. And to celebrate, we're offering an afternoon of poetry and spoken word from two, three local Southern California tribal poets. The event is listed on our social media webpage. And in closing, I hope you enjoyed these cultural Zoom events offered by the UCLA American Indian Studies Center. If you wish to continue to see more work like this, please consider donating by visiting our website at aisc.ucla.edu. And this concludes our Zoom event. Thank you.